Give me just a minute. You were set up. Pastor <laughs> Mark set you up. See, in Islam, they are very good about teaching the origins of the Quran. 
in, in Christianity, we simply say, here's the book, read it. And we don't really talk about its sources very much. That profound theologian, that well-known theologian, Lisa Simpson. <laughs> now, I'm not, a, I'm not a big Simpsons fan. I don't think I've ever actually watched an entire episode of The Simpsons uh, from to, uh, beginning to end. But I hear tell that she says something like this. She's talking to a guy named Ned, and she says, how do we know the guys who wrote the Bible didn't just make all that stuff up? And actually, that's a really good question. How do you know that the guys who wrote the Bible just didn't make it up? If somebody came to you and said, that stuff's all made up, could you respond to them? Without getting all flustered and frustrated. Well, here's what I would suggest to you, is that absolutely, we can answer that, but you have to do some learning. You have to be educated about how we got these books and how they stand up against books related to other uh, ancient historical events. This raises the whole bigger question of how do we know anything in history is true? How many of you, for example, believe that there used to be this guy named George Washington? How many of you believe that he existed at one point in time? Okay, so you're saying that he existed. Second question is, how do you know? Okay, you know about the George Washington is just because of what it's written about. Any other options? I've been to his grave. You've been to his grave, so you've been to basically a big rock <laughs> that says George Washington is buried here. It's kind of like Elvis, right? Yeah. Like, Elvis. Right there. Okay. You've been to his house. Okay. Anything? Any other bits of bits of evidence? He's on the money. We have we have pictures of George Washington. <laughs> Actually, we don't have pictures. We have paintings of George, of this guy that people say is George Washington. How many of you have actually met George Washington? No. How many of you, how many of you know somebody who met George Washington? So how can you really be confident that that grave or that house or what you read in the books or the fact that we can see pictures of them, how do you know that that means that there was a real person named George Washington? The strongest pieces of evidence that we have are twofold. The first one is that he wrote a lot. So we have a lot of stuff signed by George Washington, and then we have a lot of eyewitnesses who confirm that there was a man named George Washington, and he existed, and what he did. We have a record of his existence. So proving that George Washington existed is exactly the same thing as proving that Jesus existed. It's exactly the same kind of evaluation of the, the legends about George Washington as we would do for the information about Jesus. You know, the, the thing about the, the cherry tree and George Washington never happened. So just because you read it in the history books doesn't mean that it actually happened. So what we have to do is be able to separate the fact from the legend. Well, when we're evaluating any kind of historical document, there are a series of rules and principles that historians use, the people who study history for a living, that they use for evaluating whether or not the documents they have from a, from a historical era are good or not, whether they're reliable information about the events that they're talking about. The key factor for every historical event is, are there eyewitnesses that accurately and faithfully communicate the information? That's the key historical fact. Do you have anybody who actually saw this stuff happen, that whatever it's going to be, whether it's George Washington or whether it's Jesus? And this is the key factor here, is that we have an eyewitness testimony. And so the question then, well, what about these eyewitnesses? Are they reliable? Again, because they're all long gone, we have to use the principles and rules of judging historical documents. Now, the great thing about this is that Christianity doesn't make any special claims. We're not saying, well, you can't use usual rules of judging history for Christianity. We're special. We don't need the same rules. No, in fact, we have to demand the same rules because usually the critics of Christianity who say that Jesus didn't live or that Jesus didn't rise from the dead or that, the, that Paul hijacked Christianity, those critics claim that we can't trust the document. So we have to be able to go to them and say, look, let's take all of your histories of, say, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, let's use the same rules for evaluating Christianity's claims as we use for everybody else. No special treatment. We want exactly the same rules. That's fair, right? Usually the critics will say, no, we need a special set of rules for Christianity. We have all these other rules for evaluating historical claims, 
we want a special set of rules for Christianity. We just say that's just unfair. What we want is the same rules for everybody. So here's what we have. Three basic principles for evaluating the reliability of ancient manuscripts. The first one is the bibliographic test. The bibliographic test has two main parts to it. How reliable are the manuscripts and how close, how early are they? That is, how close to the events were they written? The last survivor from World War I, the last veteran from World War I recently died. The last person who served in the military conflict. That is the last eyewitness to the military conflict known as World War I. But did World War I happen? Sure. Same idea. How close after the events of Jesus' life did these manuscripts start to write about? The second principle is the internal evidence test. Are they internally consistent? The third test is their external evidence that supports what's in the manuscripts. So we have in just in the last couple minutes that I have here, we're just going to focus on one little piece of this puzzle. And that is dating the New Testament to people who lived when Jesus was alive. And I think that when we look at Christianity, our evidence fares quite favorably. We'll talk more about the details about how we compare with other religions. But let's just get, have some encouragement here that the people who wrote the New Testament lived in the time period just after Jesus died. So we have a handful of pieces of evidence of this. The first one is this. First of all, we don't have the original manuscript. That in and of itself is a piece of evidence. We don't have the original manuscripts, but you know what? That just puts us on exactly the same playing field as every other historical event. For any ancient event from that era and before, we have no original documents. Nobody does. For anything. So Christianity is in the same boat as everybody else. But what we do have are copies of manuscripts. And by manuscripts, I'm talking about Paul's handwritten letter to the Corinthians, Paul's handwritten letter to the Romans, John's handwritten gospel and revelation and his letters. Those actual original things, we don't have them anymore, but we have our copies. Now, here's a basic lesson in logic. In order to have a copy of something, that thing already has to exist. You can't make a copy of something that doesn't already exist. So if we can take the manuscripts that we do have, assign them a specific date by scientific methods, then and we know that they're copies, then we know that whatever they're copies of already existed. So as it turns out, when we look at the actual ancient manuscripts, the copies of ancient papyrus on which the New Testament manuscripts are written, that when we date those, we have some that are as dated as early as 130 AD. Now Jesus was crucified about 30 AD. So that's about 100 years after Jesus was crucified. That's pretty good, because that's a copy of something that existed before the copy existed. So that's a good sign. We had a couple of new discoveries over the last couple of years. There were 16 pieces of papyrus were discovered that were, that were segments of the New Testament, and they were all dated before 200, so that's within 150 years or so of Jesus dying. But the oldest one is from a passage of the Gospel of Mark, that is dated within the lifetime, within 30 years of Jesus' crucifixion. That means that the document of Mark's gospel, the earliest hard evidence we have, is within the lifetime of a person who could have actually seen Jesus. That's pretty remarkable, because I'm going to tell you, there is no ancient event for which we have that, except for Jesus. That's the only one, it's the only ancient event for which we have that kind of manuscript evidence. A third point is that we can look at the early church fathers, that first generation of church fathers, the first generation were the apostles, and then we have the people who were the apostles, the disciples of the apostles. So we have, in this case, we have three separate church fathers, Clement, Ignatius, and Polycarp, all of whom were writing at the end of the first century, beginning of the second century, and everybody agrees when they lived and when they were writing, secular and Christian scholars. They all agree when they were alive and writing. What's interesting about what they write is that they quote extensively from our current New Testament. Before there even was a New Testament, they were quoting from these books, they were quoting from the Gospels, they were quoting from Paul's and Peter's and John's letters. So here's the thing. Let's say, let's say Clement, for example. If Clement is writing in 95, and he's quoting and commenting on documents that already exist, that means that those documents had to have been written when? 
before 95. So the accusation that Christianity's documents were rewritten for hundreds of years afterwards, simply from a, an objective historical standpoint, simply is untrue. It's factually ignorant and incorrect. These men were writing and quoting from it. In fact, if we take the first two generations of church fathers, and we look at their direct quotations from the New Testament books, that even without any copies of the letters themselves, we could completely reconstruct the entire New Testament except for 27 verses. Just from the quotations of people who claim to be quoting from these letters and these books. They already existed in the form that we have them now in the first century and then in the early second century. That's extraordinary. There, I'm telling you, there is no other historical event or individual for whom we have that close a testimony from eyewitnesses and people who knew eyewitnesses. Fourth, we can look at the text itself. And the way we analyze history is one of the ways that, if we have things that don't have dates, one of the ways that we date them is we look at what do they talk about and what do they not talk about. If there are important things that are left out, then that's evidence for when we might have the person might have stopped talking about them. So one of these is one of these pieces of evidence is what is not mentioned in the New Testament that we would expect to be there. For example, Jesus prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. History historians agree that this occurred in AD 70. This is well known, well recorded, well attested. But it's not mentioned in Acts or anywhere else in the New Testament. This was one of the few prophecies of Jesus that actually has already come true. You would think that people trying to build the legitimacy and the validity of their own faith tradition would say, look, he, we're trying to evangelize the Jews. Look, this man was a prophet because what he prophesied came true. Luke is silent. Doesn't mention it. On top of that, in the early history of the church, we have a few relatively important people. People like James brother of Jesus, Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, and Peter, who actually walked with Jesus. They were executed, everybody agrees on this, they were executed in AD 62, 64, and 65, respectfully. Because they were so important to the early church, if their martyrdom was recorded like Stephen's is recorded, if that had happened, they would, Paul Luke, who was writing this, would have said, this is when these men were executed. That's his son. The only reason we know when they were executed is because the first and second generation of church fathers told us when they were executed, so we can say it. Nero persecuted Christians beginning in AD 64. This is a tremendous persecution. I mean, horrific, really horrific. Luke is silent about the Nero persecution. So what does all this suggest? That Luke wrote about the things that were happening around him in the previous few years' history. But he's silent on the most important prophecy Jesus gave that came true in his lifetime. He's silent on the martyrdom of the three most important men in the New Testament church. And he's silent on the most important persecution of the church. That tells us there are two ways we can go with this. One is that he intentionally left this stuff out. The other logical option, it hadn't happened yet. Which means that we can take Acts and we can say, with a great deal of confidence, Acts was written before AD 62, the first date of something really important to Christianity that isn't recorded there. So we can be confident about that. Last thing, we can look at what is in the text. To what extent does the text tell us stuff that happened, or make allusions to things that happened, that give us confidence, that enable us to make some dates. And the first one of these is that Luke, writing Acts, Acts 1, verse 1, Acts, chapter 1, verse 1, says, in my former book, in my former writings. So that tells us Luke wrote two books. The first, he's writing in one here, that's Acts. There must have been one that existed before that. So if Acts is written before 62, guess when Luke was written? Sometime before 62, because it's called the former writing. Right? So just from a logical approach to the way that he talks about the dates, we can identify when these texts were written. Paul, who we know already was executed in AD 64, so he's right, everything he writes is written before AD 64, he refers to Luke. He quotes the Gospel of Luke. 
calling it scripture. Peter talks about Paul's writings. So Peter's executed in 65, Paul's executed in 64, and Peter says, look at Paul's writings, and he equates them with the Holy Scriptures. Now, if we know they died at that certain date, then we have confidence that the things that they're talking about existed before those dates. So this is what we conclude, is that these things that people say were written and rewritten over centuries actually have very early evidence that we can have a lot of confidence in that these were written by eyewitnesses at an early date, much earlier than any other ancient event. The final conclusion by the experts. Here's one of them, his name is William Albright, he's an archaeologist who studies the Bible lands, studies Bible manuscripts, and he says, we can already say emphatically, and this is several years ago, that there is no longer any solid basis for dating any book of the New Testament after about A.D. 80. Even there's some debate within Christianity about that. But he's got the dates about right. He says, in my opinion, every book of the New Testament was written by a baptized Jew between the 40s and the 80s of the first century, and very probably sometime between about A.D. 50 and A.D. 75. We have repeated testimony of experts using unbiased methods that they use for evaluating every other ancient historical manuscript. And Christianity and the New Testament occur and are evaluated very favorably. Folks, we can have a great deal of confidence in these documents because they're historically reasonably good records of the day better than any other ancient event. And that should be encouraging to you. So, when people say stuff like the atheists and the Muslims, and they make those accusations, just ask them, is that true? How do you know that's true? And ask them for the evidence that they have on their behalf. And then you can say, well, let me tell you about my manuscript. That will go well, and we don't deal with that.